a life well lived. How, how, would you, how would you define a life well lived? And, you know, perhaps there are different perspectives ba- based on age. If you're, um, if you're younger, you probably don't even spend much time contemplating that question. But, but it's, a, it's a valuable one as, as you're a younger person heading into life. Uh, what are the things that will be of great, greatest value to you? What are the things that you can invest your in, yourself in? What are the things to avoid so that you don't go down dead ends that, that really are of, of no value? And uh, as, as we put on the years and as we have fewer ahead of us than we, or fewer, uh, yeah, fewer ahead of us than we have behind us, um, what, what are the things that we look back on and say, those, those were good decisions. I, I am so thankful the, the Lord guided me in that direction. Um, how, how do we end well as we um, look to, to whatever the future may hold? And as a pastor, I've worked with a lot of church members, and you know there are, there, there's a group of church members that just have a, 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 a settled sense of security in the relationship with God. And it overflows in their relationships in their family. It overflows in their relationships in the church. Um, it overflows in, in their, their faithfulness and service and in giving. And it overflows in an in a internal sense of peace. And that is not measured by the absence of difficulty. In fact, oftentimes it is most vividly seen because of the presence of difficulties in their life. But despite the the difficulties, there is a peace and a calm and a confidence because they know God is in control and they, they place their trust in him. And I, I think of my father. I've mentioned him a number of times this weekend. And he is at this point on hospice care. He is in the, the later stages of Parkinson's and Parkinson's dementia and is very, very weak. And as, as I have watched him over the last number of years lose, lose various abilities, uh, lose his ability to, to recognize uh, family members. Uh, I, it was a few years ago. Um, I'd spent a week with him. My mother was in the hospital, so I was uh, living with my father, taking care of him for the week. And near the end of that week, I asked him, Dad, and I prompted him, Dad, who, who am I? And, um, and, and, and he didn't know. Um, he, a, a, a nice man. Well, I, and I'm thankful for that. Um, but despite the, the, the losses mentally and physically where you know, he loses the ability to walk, and he used to be a, a great walker. I remember as a child, he had a, a big stride that I could barely keep up with um, and loved to, to get outside and, and exercise and work. And um, as he's lost one thing after the next in his life, he has cultivated and has throughout his life cultivated a spirit of contentment and a spirit of peace. And so even with all of the losses, there, there is that, that settled sense of peace that, that has remained. And of course, as his son and, and my sisters, as we have cared for him and, and spent time with him, we're grateful that, that he has that. And we're especially grateful that, that soon he will be asleep in Jesus. And the next thing he knows, he is going to walk with great vigor and strength. I talked about how he, he has a, a curiosity. He loved to travel. He loved to explore. Whenever, whenever they would go to uh, a new place, um, a, a, there was a new building. My, my uh, father and mother would go for a program. My mom just simply got used to the fact that she would be by herself 
for the first little bit because dad was off exploring and he would come back with stories of, of what was down this hallway and what was back behind the platform or stage and, and um, just, just loved to, to check and see what was going on. And I'm thinking, you know, give him the universe to explore. He's going to have a grand time. Um, that, that, that will really be heaven for him. And, of course, it will be great to, to be together with him, with, with him clear-minded. But I'd like to take a look at one of the great characters that we find in the Bible and look at eight key lessons for a life well-lived. It's a familiar story, and, and I'm going to hop, skip, and jump through the story and encourage you, uh, Genesis chapters 35 to, to 50, the story of Joseph because um, the story is all there. Um, most of you are probably familiar with it, and I'll recount portions of it, but again, I'll, I'll skip around and, and do some backtracking to, to get these, these eight, eight points of a life well lived from the life of Joseph. So the first one here, uh, from Genesis 37, verse 14, then he said to him, that would be Jacob, the father of Joseph, said to Joseph, Please, go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem. And here we find one of the instances in Joseph's life where he recognized that God calls us to respect others, particularly those who are in positions of responsibility in our lives. And so... Uh, Joseph was asked to go by, by his father Jacob, and so he agreed to go. Now, when we look at the biblical account, one of the interesting things about the family of Jacob is that in, in, in today's language, we would say that they were very dysfunctional. You know, and, and it, went, it was, it was multi-generational dysfunctions, passed down from one generation to the next. And in the case of Jacob, he had four wives, recipe for disaster. Um, just, just a really bad idea on so many levels. And so because of that, you have rivalries with the son. And Joseph was the, the um, of the 12 sons, he is the 11th. But he is the first son of Rachel, who is the best love of the four wives that Jacob had. And, and Jacob, again, part of his dysfunction, just multiple times in his life, did not exercise real good judgment. And so here he, he had a love for Joseph as the firstborn of his beloved wife, Rachel, who was now deceased. And unfortunately, he let that favoritism show and displayed it. And, and so the older 10 brothers really grew to resent Joseph and, and the way Jacob favored Joseph. And neither Jacob nor Joseph truly understood the deep resentment and even hatred that was being cultivated in the hearts of the 10 older brothers. And, and if they had, J Jacob never would have asked Joseph to go. And of course, Jacob had reason to have concern for his sons who were there. You, you know, remember in that passage it said they left from Hebron and went to Shechem. Well, Shechem, you go back a couple of chapters earlier in Genesis, and um, Shechem was a young man who was attracted to the sister of these brothers, Dinah, and violated her and decided, let's make this right, let me just marry her. And so they agreed that if all the men in Shechem's village would be circumcised, then this marriage could proceed. So Shechem incredibly convinced all the men in town, and on the third day, when uh, they were in pain, it says that Simeon and Levi two of those older brothers went and they destroyed every man in town. And, and then the rest of the brothers came, they looted the town, took the rest of, 
of the occupants as, as slaves. And of course, Jacob is fearful saying, yes, I have 12 sons, but there's no way that I have an army that can resist um, all of the, the others um, towns that are in this region and they're going to come back and seek revenge and destroy us. And God protected them. But Jacob has reason to be concerned when his sons are going back to the area around Shechem because they could easily um, be uh, victims of revenge. So Joseph agrees and he happily goes off to meet his brothers and he's wearing the coat that his father had given to him, this, this coat of a, of a ruler that to his brothers demonstrated Jacob's favoritism towards Joseph. And as they see him coming, um, they first devise a simple plan. Let's just kill him. Let's just kill him and we'll, we'll be done with him. And uh, they land up selling him into slavery instead. And it's interesting too, they sell him to, you remember the story, they sell him to the Ishmaelites. And of course, the Ish, Ishmael himself was the great uncle of these brothers. Ishmael was the firstborn son of Abraham, their, their grandfather. And so their cousins are traveling down to Egypt and they decide, let's sell Joseph into slavery to our cousins, and we will be rid of Joseph, but we won't be having his blood on our hands, and we can simply put the blood of a lamb on his coat and show it to our father, and our father can come to his own conclusions. And so that's what they did. And Patriarchs and Prophet tells us that in that short journey from Canaan down to Egypt, that um, Joseph quickly became a man. Instead of living a pampered life in his father's household, he, he had to determine what kind of a life he was going to live and how he was, what, what principles that he would follow. So we find the, the, the first lesson, God calls us to respect others. And we find that not only was that the case of Joseph respecting his father, but he lands up in Potiphar's household and he respects Potiphar, his master, slave owner, if you will, and serves him diligently and with integrity and honesty. And over and over, Joseph demonstrates those, those characteristics. So we come to uh, the second characteristic we find, Genesis chapter 39, verse 6. Thus he left, this is Potiphar, he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. So the second lesson we learn, God calls us to work diligently where we are. And God certainly blessed the efforts of Joseph, but Joseph applied lessons of industry and diligence in his work, honesty and integrity in the way that he approached that. And, and Potiphar saw that and, and he recognized that whatever Joseph did prospered it, it did well. And the more that Joseph was responsible for in his household, the, the better off Potiphar's household was. And the, the, the more profitable his household was. And so finally, he just let Joseph be responsible for everything because that was the, the, the smartest thing that he could do. And we find that the next chapter, if you will, of Joseph's life when he lands up imprisoned, that again, he has a choice to make once he's falsely accused and imprisoned unjustly he has a choice to make. How is he going to live his life? Um, going from slavery to imprisonment. And he determines that he's going to live with integrity. He's going to practice industry. He's, he's going to be respectful of those that are around him and, and look for ways to serve them. And he's, he's going to avoid all the, the, the cultural entrapments that are around him. 
there were all kinds of pagan gods in Egypt that he could have chosen to worship. And here, here he's a young man, he could have said, okay, I'm now in Egypt, I'm no longer in my father's household. I need to culturally adapt in every way, including worshiping the gods of the Egyptians. And, and that's gonna be the, the key to success here is adopt all the ways of the Egyptians and that's how I'm going to get ahead. But instead he said, I'm gonna remain faithful to God. And so he didn't allow his mind to, to follow the lines of thought that would lead him to, to enviousness of, of Potiphar or deciding to, to join in the, the pagan rituals and, and worship practices of the Egyptians. Instead, he determined that he would work diligently and remain faithful to God. Third lesson that we find in Joseph's life, he recognized and gave God credit for God's work in his life. Genesis 41, 16, uh, later on in Joseph's life, so Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me, God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. After being falsely imprisoned, Pharaoh has two dreams and he is disturbed by these dreams. He can tell that these dreams have significance and importance for him as, as Pharaoh. And he calls his wise men and none of them are able to give any reasonable explanation of what these dreams mean. And finally he learns of, of Joseph in prison and he is so desperate, he's, he's willing to suffer the embarrassment of, of recognizing his wise men are not able to interpret these dreams. Let me ask this foreigner in prison what these dreams are about. And so he calls Joseph out, Joseph cleans up and cuts his hair and all that to, to come and appear before Pharaoh. And this, this is Joseph's great moment of opportunity. And it would be very easy for, for him to say, yes, Pharaoh, I will interpret these dreams for you. Instead, he, he, he acknowledged, it's not in me to do this, but God can do it. And he immediately recognized the wisdom that only comes from God. And he gave testimony of that to Pharaoh when he could have leveraged that for his own gain. And questions for, for us as, as we look at these lessons from the life of Joseph is which of these lessons most apply to you at this point in your life? Um, is it a matter of, of giving credit to God as you look at the blessings in your life, the good things that, that you enjoy, um, giving God credit for, for those good things? Is it a matter of, as Joseph did in Potiphar's house, of working with diligence? And, and you're at a point of, of, of needing to, to work with industry and diligence and integrity. Is it acknowledging God in the, the blessings that he provides? The next lesson that we find from Joseph's experience, God calls us to live with a plan for the future. Genesis 41, uh, verses 33 and on. Now therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and let, set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years and let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. And it goes on with this plan because the, the dreams made it clear there were going to be seven years of plenty. They were gonna have plentiful crops for seven years, but that would be followed by seven years of severe famine. And so Pharaoh recognizes this, this is a crisis that is, is coming to his nation, and his people are going to be not only impoverished, but they're gonna be starving, and, um, and they're gonna be coming to Pharaoh, looking to him, since they worship him as a god, why isn't he fixing the problem? And so he, he's asking, what can we do in order to avert, to minimize this crisis? And Joseph comes forward with a, a plan that shows great wisdom. And he says, during the seven years of plenty, appoint someone to go through and gather uh, a fifth, 20%. Essentially, 
Joseph was recommending. Raise taxes by 20%. And during those seven years of plenty, the storehouses were filled. And he said then, during the seven years of famine, you can sell the food to those who are needing it so that they do not starve. And, and the crisis can be averted. He had a plan. And now we look at the earlier life of Joseph and say, what was Joseph's plan when he was in Potiphar's household, when he was in prison? He didn't have a lot of opportunity to exercise freedom. But his plan was quite simple. Trust God and do the work that God presented to him as diligently as he could. And God blessed that diligence. God blessed his, his industry. And when there was opportunity for him to exercise wisdom, God blessed him and gave him a plan that could be used in order to save the people of Egypt and beyond. So we look at the next lesson. We start to get to some of the, the challenging points in Joseph's life with this one. Genesis 45, 5, God calls us to forgive others. But now, he's speaking to his brothers, do not, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. Joseph's brothers have, have come. They've heard of the food that is available in Egypt during the famine. And so Jacob says to his sons, go down and get food from, from Egypt. Go and, and buy some of this food so that our family doesn't starve to death here in Canaan. So the 10 older brothers of, of Joseph go. His younger brother, Benjamin, wasn't allowed to go by Jacob because Jacob had already lost Joseph and he didn't want to lose Benjamin. So he sends the 10 older brothers down to, to Egypt. His brothers don't recognize him He's speaking fluent Egyptian now. Um, he looks like an Egyptian, sounds like an Egyptian, and is a ruler in Egypt. And so interestingly, they come and they are bowing down to him as a ruler in Egypt. And Joseph quickly remembers the dreams of his youth when he saw his brothers bowing down before him. Part of what made them so angry with him and hate him so much when they were younger. And now they are acting out exactly what Joseph had dreamt. Joseph, before his brothers had come, had already made peace with the fact that we, we find he says that God had sent him there. Now, the active agents for that sending were his brothers. But God, God was working and overruling in his life to take him to Egypt in order to accomplish God's purpose, to save his own family. And, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing looking at Joseph's experience. Over and over, we see Satan trying to destroy and discourage Joseph. You know, here he's the promised son and uh, or, or the, 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 the valued son of Jacob. And Satan stirs up the hatred of his brothers. They sell him into slavery. And Satan rejoices over the miseries that he's brought to Joseph and to Jacob and the guilt that his brothers now have. And yet God is saying, perfect the plan is right on track. They are going to need to be saved and Joseph is going to be right where he needs to be in order to accomplish the salvation. He's sold into slavery and he's sold into Potiphar's household where he is captain of the king's guard. Um, it, it, it provides Joseph an opportunity to be exposed to the, the royal courts and, and the people of high position and education. And so as Joseph is serving there, he is able to, to learn lessons that most slaves would never happen, have an opportunity to learn because he's able to, to see and interact and, and learn from 
those who are in, in positions of leadership. And so Satan says, this, this is not good. I have to put a stop to this. Uh, Joseph is too successful. And so Potiphar's wife is tempting Joseph. He resists her advances. She makes false accusations. And Potiphar, in order to uh, protect the respectability of his home, has to throw Joseph in prison. And again, Patriarchs and Prophets tells us that if Potiphar truly believed his wife, Joseph would have been executed. But Potiphar knew the integrity of Joseph. But he also had to protect the honor of his home, and so Joseph is thrown into prison. And again, Satan exalts that, that Joseph is, is uh, put in an even more difficult set of circumstances. And again, God overrules that and says, that's just where he needs to be in order to provide help to the, the or, or at least um, counsel to the baker and the cupbearer of the king. And he's where he needs to be in order to be brought before Pharaoh. Over and over, what Satan meant as a curse to Joseph by the grace and the providence of God is overturned in order to be a blessing. And, and so often in our lives, we look at the difficulties, the challenges that we face, and we think, God, where are you? What are you doing? This is awful. I am not enjoying this at all. Why are you allowing this calamity to come into my life? And God is working out a wonderful plan for our lives. That if we knew the, the end from the beginning, we would say, God, please do just exactly what you're doing. But in our short-sightedness, all we see and experience is the, the difficulty. And so like Joseph, we need to walk by faith, trusting in God's leading. But back to, to uh, Joseph forgiving his brothers. Joseph could see God's hand leading in his life. And he had long ago forgiven his brothers for what they had done. And he tells them when they are fearful that he is going to seek revenge on them now that he is a ruler and in a position of authority over them. He could have killed them as spies, as he threatened to do. Um, he could have thrown them all into prison. And Joseph said, God has led me here. God has had a purpose for me to be able to preserve our family. And he had forgiven his brothers for what they had done. Now forgiveness isn't, isn't an easy thing. It's, it's not in our human nature to forgive others. It, it's a gift of God. And, and sometimes there are the, the minor slights that, that come every day in our lives. Uh, people seem to ignore us. Seem, people overlook us. Uh, people say things that are, are negative or critical or derogatory about us. Someone cuts us off on the, the highway. There are all kinds of, of slights that, that we experience in life. And then there are some deep, lasting ways in which people hurt us, um, sometimes intentionally, sometimes inadvertently, uh, and sometimes they are sorry, sometimes they are not sorry. And what do we do with those, those circumstances, and, and how do we relate to those people in our lives? How do we relate to people that have have hurt us deeply and wrongfully, and yet they've passed away. And there's no opportunity to go and, and, and make peace and, and seek restoration with them. The forgiveness that we need to have truly comes as a gift from God. Uh, to have a heart that is, is willing to forgive as God has forgiven us. Remember the Lord's Prayer, uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In the same way that, that we recognize God has forgiven us, he calls us to get, have a forgiving spirit towards other people. 
oftentimes with those deep hurts, it is, it is a matter of conviction, not feeling. The, the feeling of forgiveness may not be there, but we can pray that the Lord would give us a spirit of forgiveness, that we choose, we make a choice to forgive someone and ask God to bring the healing into our lives and if possible into the relationship. Obviously, someone has to be receptive to the spirit of the Lord in order to, um, to ask for forgiveness and to, to for, have, for reconciliation to take place. But are we willing, are we open for the Lord to, to bring that about in our experience? Now, back to the dysfunctions of the family, because as much as the scriptures call us to be forgiving of others, Joseph teaches us another important principle here, and that is that God calls us to have appropriate boundaries in our families. Genesis 42, 25, then Joseph gave a command to fill their sacks, the, the, the sacks of his brothers, with grain to restore every man's money to his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. Thus he did for them. So initially, his brothers have come to Egypt to buy food. He questions them. He accuses them of being spies in, in Egypt to, to check out the weaknesses of Egypt during this famine. Uh, they deny that. And so he finally agrees to, to let them go. But he says, put the money in their sacks. And Simeon has to stay in prison while you go back. And if you need any more food and you come back expecting to buy food, your younger brother had better be with you. Each of those things intended to test his brothers. Joseph had already forgiven his brothers. They didn't know it yet. They didn't even know that they were dealing with Joseph. But Joseph had already forgiven his brothers, but he, he recognized that to go back into a relationship with his brothers and his fathers where the same hatred existed would only continue the dysfunctions and, and problems in his family. And so he's testing his brothers to see have they grown, have they matured, have they learned from where they were when they sold them into slavery. And so he does these things and, and uh, eventually they run out of food again and Jacob does not want to send them back. He's already lost Joseph. He doesn't want to risk Benjamin, his youngest son, and, and uh, the, the only other son of his beloved wife, Rachel. But it's, that, it's either risk losing Benjamin or starvation for, for the whole extended family. And so finally, his, his sons convince him to let them go, to take Benjamin, they take back the original money that had been in their sacks plus additional money to buy more and they go down to Egypt. And there Joseph goes through a, a, a series of further tests to understand if his brothers are resentful of Benjamin as they were of him. And he finds that they have a very different spirit. Um, in fact, um, he hides, has his, his cup that the Egyptians believed was a magic cup so that um, the rulers could, could discern if someone was poisoning them. And he had that cup put into Benjamin's sack of food and as they were leaving the city, um, they were stopped and accused of, of the theft and they said, no, none of us would do that. Um, and said that the one whose sack it is would, would be killed and the rest of them would be imprisoned. Anyway, they, they all go back. Joseph then reveals himself to his brothers, wanting to be restored in a healthy way to relationships with his brothers and with his family. Forgiveness doesn't mean that we continue in old patterns of abuse and violation. We need to forgive, but we also need to establish healthy boundaries and relationships in our lives. And Joseph gives us a, a great example of that taking place. 
So we look at another lesson, uh, the seventh one here in the life of, of Joseph. Recognize the sp special purpose that God has for you. Genesis 45, 7. He's talking to his brothers, and he says, God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Now, most of us are not going to have this great, incredible life story that Joseph has, where we go from slavery to imprisonment to being next to, to the, the, the greatest ruler in the world. That, that's not the experience that most of us ever have. But God in the realm that each one of us lives in has a special purpose for each one of our lives. He, he knew us in the womb. He has a special plan and purpose. And, and the question is, do we recognize that we are not just randomly going through life day by day willy-nilly, but that God has a purpose for our lives and he has an intentionality in how we interact with other people. And what we talked about this, this morning, that, that we are his ambassadors, and he's given us a, a commission and a, and a purpose. And how we live out our lives, those decisions, allow us to give expression to that purpose that God has called us for. And that, that we can cooperate with God and experience the fulfillment of that purpose. Now, differently from Joseph, we may not have clarity on all of that purpose this side of heaven. Joseph here was still relatively young, and he recognizes that God had overruled circumstances in his life and was accomplishing something great in order to preserve his family. And of course, they knew the promises that God had given to, to Abraham, the, the promised land, the Canaan, and, and that, that that was designated by God for them, and that Abraham's descendants were to be a great, uh, great multitude, a numberless multitude on the face of the earth. They knew these promises that God had given. But all of the, the specifics of the, the plans and purposes, they did not know day by day, but they walked by faith, claiming the promises of God. And that's what we do as well, recognize day by day that God has a special purpose. And by living in faithfulness to him, we, we live out that purpose and accomplish his design for our lives. And we go to the, the final lesson from Joseph's life. Genesis chapter 50, final chapter in the book of Genesis. Uh, he could rest with confidence on the promises of God. Genesis 50, 25 tells us, then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. Now his father, Jacob, had said, when I die, I want to be buried in the promised land. And so Joseph asked for permission from Pharaoh to, to leave Egypt, and he and his brothers took his father's body to be buried there in the promised land. Joseph instead asked that the children of Israel would take his body and when God took all of the Israelites back to the promised land, that they would take his body. He, of course, had choices. He was living in Egypt, the land of the pharaohs, the land of the pyramids. And he could have said, I want to be buried in a pyramid. I want to be buried like, like the pharaohs. I want to be preserved here in Egypt. But instead, he said, I want to be buried in the land promised to us by God. That, that is the, the ultimate of what God has promised to give to us. And in, on his deathbed, he expressed confidence that the promise of God would be fulfilled even though he wasn't going to live to see it happen.
We don't know when our last day will come on earth. Um, in, in, earlier in this, this meeting this evening, there was the, the prayer that if, if the Lord doesn't come in the next year, that we would gather together for camp meeting again, again next year. We don't know the day or the hour. When Jesus will come, or the day or the hour, when our life will end and we will go to sleep in Jesus. But regardless of when it comes, we can recognize that the promise of God is just as sure to us as it was to Joseph. And we can have the same confidence that Joseph had that just as God was going to fulfill the promise to take the Israelites back to the promised land of Canaan, that he will take us to the heavenly Canaan, that the, the promises of God remain safe and secure, and we can have confidence that, that his plan is secure. My father, unless God comes very soon, is not going to live to see the second coming of Jesus without death. But he will go with peace and confidence that what God has promised, he will do. And when he closes his eyes for the last time, it will seem like simply an instant and Jesus will be coming and his body, his mind will be restored and he can look forward to the heavenly Canaan. And so wherever we are in life, whether we're at the beginning and as Joseph was as a young man starting out, facing difficulties, facing uncertainties, living day by day, choosing to be uh, industrious and living with, with integrity, or whether we are at the end of our life and there's not much life left to be lived, we can have confidence in God's leading and guidance we can continue to have this hope and this confidence that Jesus is coming again, that he has his plan and purpose for each one of us. Come, follow me, Jesus says. And that includes, follow me as long as life shall last and trust me past when your life has lasted. Trust me that I will come again, that I've gone to prepare a place for you, and that I will come again to take you to that place. We have this hope that Jesus has given to us. And if you want to, to claim that hope again tonight, I invite you to stand with me and stand before the Lord and let's, let's reclaim those precious promises that Jesus is coming again, that we can have confidence in his leading and his guidance, even in the face of death, and know that he will lead us and be with us. Let's bow our heads together. Dear Lord, we thank you for the example of Joseph. We thank you for the, the lessons that we can learn from his life. Lord, I pray that each day we would choose to live with confidence in your leading and your guidance. Whether our circumstances are grim, whether we are facing painful circumstances, or whether we are enjoying great blessings, may we place our confidence in you. Lord, may we place our hope in you in the promise that you are coming again soon, that you are preparing a place in heaven for us. We thank you for these promises. We thank you for the assurance of salvation. We thank you for your grace, your sacrifice for each one of us. May we live each day for you, and may we live in great anticipation of an eternity with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.